Hello and welcome everyone to the first talk in Perspectives, our new distinguished speaker series at the Media Lab. My name is Patty Maas and I'm one of the faculty here at the Media Lab. I am very fortunate to start our talk series with a very deep thinker and a fascinating speaker whose work and writings are not just of general interest, but are especially relevant, I think, to the Media Lab and its larger community of innovators. Juan Enriquez is a Mexican-American academic, businessman, and author. He is a TED all-star speaker, having given over 11 TED Talks. He has sailed around the world, sampling microbial genomes throughout the world's oceans, has helped negotiate a peace deal with the Chiapas Zapatistas in Mexico, has worked on economic policy for Mexico's Secretary of State, and he is widely regarded as a leading authority on the political and, and economic impacts of the life sciences. In his day job, he is a managing director of Excel Venture Management. He has written several books about emerging technologies and how they may impact society, including As the Future Catches You and Evolving Ourselves. His most recent book, Right Wrong, which you will talk about today, is a fascinating and timely read on how technology advances um, change our notions of what is right and wrong. And before we start with Juan's talk, I want to quickly comment um, or uh, let all of you know that you will have an opportunity for asking questions, which you can submit via the Slido link that should be just below the live stream window. With that, I'd like to welcome Juan and thank both Juan and really all of you in the audience, invisible audience, for joining us today. Well, thank you so much, Patty. Um, and it's great fun to be with all of you. Um, this is not going to be an easy talk. It's not going to provide you with a whole bunch of answers. Um, it's a talk about right, wrong. And as such, there are many versions of right, wrong. Um, if you feel uncomfortable, if you feel that there are topics that are very sensitive to you, this may not be the right talk for you. So with that warning, um, let's go straight into this. Let's talk about war. Um, so war used to be something that you did face to face and it was brutal. It was horrible. Um, but there were certain rules of engagement. There were certain rules of honor that weren't always followed, but you, you saw your enemy and there was sometimes chivalry involved in some of these en encounters. When you put technology into war, for instance, when you put the machine gun, what you do is you dehumanize the other side completely. You never see the other side. If you see the other side, you shoot immediately. There's absolutely no ambiguity about that. And so what machine guns did is it drove people into trenches. And so you couldn't even see the people. If anything, you could see a little helmet sticking up. And what that did is it created this no man's land, which was one of the most horrendous spots on earth. Um, and if you entered no man's land, you likely ended up dead. And if you left your trench in the other direction, then you likely ended up dead because your own side would shoot you. And in a strange way, what's happened to us recently, partly because of social media, is that debates that used to be face-to-face, -face, where you look the person in the eye and say, I disagree with you, or I agree with you, or you're an idiot, or you know, you're a very smart person, have now turned into these debates that are driven at a distance. And you don't see the face, you don't see the person, you don't see the person's reaction. In fact, sometimes you're not even sure you're arguing with a person. And as you're thinking about this, the way in which we're debating and shooting at each other with tweets and Facebook and Instagram and posts and anonymous this and anonymous that has dehumanized human interaction and debate and put us into trenches. And you sit in a trench, which is either a conservative branch or you sit in a trench that's the liberal trench and there's just not a lot of space in between. And you're supposed to pick a side. And if you try and move towards the other side, then you get shot by the other side or by your own side. And so you end up with books that are published that 
look like this, right? And anybody who even slightly disagrees with you has got to be absolutely wrong. If you're thinking about what has caused a lot of the polarization and a lot of the anger and a lot of the things that we say about each other that we would never say face to face, it's because there's this absolute certainty that I know right from wrong. And what happens then is you don't allow discussion, you don't allow tolerance, you don't have any evolution of thought, and you certainly don't learn anything from the other side because the other side they're all this, or they're all that, or they're all baby killers, or they're all pedophiles, or they're all conservatives, or they're all liberals, or they're all this. So there's no incentive or structure in which anything they say is legitimate. They have any point whatsoever. And if they slightly disagree with you, clearly they are absolutely wrong. That's led to the situation where even your own tribe sometimes shoots at you, and sometimes your own tribe is the most cruel with you. Sometimes the people who are most destructive towards you are the people who are supposedly your workmates or your peers. And people you've worked with for 10 years say something wrong and you throw them off a cliff. And there's no benefit of the doubt. Um, they did this wrong, I know it's wrong, and that's it. And so you see instances like Al Franken being driven out of the Senate for having joked about something 10 years ago. And he was driven out not by the opposition, but by his own tribe. And I've heard that that occasionally happens in academia. So what ends up happening is you're forced to choose a side. Are you on the BLM side or are you on the, we support the police side? But the odd thing as you dig deeper into this and you ask yourself the question, why do you never see these two symbols on the same lawn at the same time? And it's odd because Two-thirds, by far a majority, supports BLM. And two-thirds doesn't want to defund the police. So the situation actually is a little bit more complicated, where it's okay to be outraged by George Floyd's murder. It's okay to not condone looting and riots. And it's okay to support good police officers. It doesn't mean that every police officer is right. It doesn't mean police are always right. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't rally and protest, but it, it means that this is more complicated than has been structured into two specific trenches, and you're either in my trench or you're in the other trench. And if you're in the other trench, then I should just shoot you. And, and that polarization divides nations, destroys countries, destroys academic departments, destroys businesses, destroys a whole series of things. The reason why this debate is so important is because even if you are Mother Teresa, let's assume for a second that you are the one in a million who is always right, you've always got the right stance, you never wear the wrong costume, you've never used the wrong words, you have been Mother Teresa since you were born. Well, even in that instance, you really should listen to people who disagree with you and the other side because Sometimes right and wrong changes over time. And so sometimes, even if you are right today, you may be wrong tomorrow. And this is especially important for this audience because what all of you are doing is you are likely involved in technology and you are the drivers of change in ethics. There is no bigger single driver of change in ethics than technology. And technology is becoming exponential and therefore ethics may begin changing at exponential rates. So these are three pretty bold statements. Let me unpack them. Let's start with technology changes ethics. Take a time machine. Well, if you take a time machine, you go back to the time of the Aztecs or the Mayans, human sacrifice used to be normal, natural, and essential because otherwise the rains wouldn't come, otherwise the sun wouldn't rise, and then a bunch of astronomers and Folks who were smart started doing the observations and realized seasons and sun, and they will rise even if you don't sacrifice people. And lo and behold, you stop sacrificing people. It became wrong to sacrifice people. Not that long ago, it used to be that you would hold public executions in the fancy squares in Paris. 
And not only would you hold the execution, you'd hold up the bleeding head to show people. So it wasn't just the Mayans or the Aztecs who were cutting out people's hearts and showing people live beating hearts. It turns out the fancy French were doing the same thing. And it turns out that you'd put you on your Sunday finest and take the kids to watch these spectacles. And we look back at this and sort of say in horror, what the hell were these people thinking? Because that seems completely wrong to us. But it took a while for us to realize that. And the guillotine games went on in French grammar schools well into the 20th century. So this image, which I think horrifies us, is an image that was considered, hey, it's part of playing for children well into the 20th century. There is a whole lot of anger at slavery today, and it is justified anger, and there's a justified fury there, and we, everybody on this call knows that slavery is wrong. And so if everybody on this call knows that slavery is wrong, why did we tolerate it for so long? And in fact, why did we tolerate it not just in the US South, but in the US North? And why did we tolerate it in Britain and China and India and the Incas and the Mayas and the Greeks and every civilization, including the Africans, at different points in their civilization supported slavery and did so for a long period of time. So if all of us know this is completely wrong, why did almost everybody support it for so long? And just as important, why did it go away in legal terms? Legal terms, I understand there's still slavery today, but it went away in legal terms as a state-supported institution in almost all countries in a very short period of time. In the 1800s, you saw this raft of countries, not all of them, I get it, there were countries in the Middle East that were still practicing this and still practice this. But legally, this went away in most countries in the late 1800s. And certainly that was a work of brave abolitionists. Certainly people like Harriet Ward Beecher and Taubman and Harriet Beecher Stowe and a whole series of other people put their lives on the line and their prestige on the line to destroy this evil institution. But was that the only factor that drove away slavery in a relatively concentrated period of a few decades? Or did it have anything to do with the beginning of the use of energy? Because a single barrel of oil contains five to 10 years of human energy. When you think of what one gallon of gas does to push your car several miles uphill and the energy required for that, you're using the energy of hundreds of human beings to move your car in different directions. And it's not perhaps a complete coincidence that when you start using energy and you start using machines that provide you thousands of horsepower, in a short period of decades, slavery begins to go away. So technology in this case acts as an enabler for a more ethical behavior. You can maintain a better lifestyle and not have to oppress millions of human beings through serfdom or through slavery or through oppression or through a whole series of other things. And the consequence of that is sometimes technology isn't just the terminator. Sometimes technology is not just the evil thing that does things to people. Sometimes it's an enabler of more ethical and moral behavior, which we should have done a long time ago, but we didn't. One of the things that happened after slavery started to go away is you saw life expectancy and wealth explode globally. So you do away with this horrendous institution, people start living a lot longer and earn more. Gay marriage. Gay marriage is another thing which, at least when I was going to school in the Jesuit school in Mexico, we went to school every day, we went to church every day, it was in Latin, and every person in that school taught me that being gay was horrendous. It was a crime against nature, it was a crime against God, it was a crime against government, it was a crime against my peers. And so every person that I grew up with told me being gay is wrong. So I guess one question I'd ask is, how was I supposed to know as a 12 year old on the playground that the words I was using were absolutely hateful, that the things that I'd been taught were absolutely hateful? Who, who was supposed to tell me that? 
right? And thank God Twitter wasn't around. Thank God Facebook wasn't around. Thank God these things weren't recorded because I was a little bigot because I was brought up a little bigot. And by the way, gay marriage was illegal and wrong in the United States and in most countries in this world for a very long time. And in 1997, two thirds of Americans opposed it. Fast forward to 2017 and all of a sudden this thing has flipped completely in the majority, 180 degrees. So all of a sudden, everything that a lot of people were taught of a certain age leads to boycotts, leads to insults, leads to, I'm going to destroy you because you hold an opinion that you were taught with and educated. And, and you know, you couldn't be on the right side for a long time and then flip it 180 degrees, even if you're the Pope. Because the Pope as Cardinal came out in 2010 and said, this is a destructive attempt towards God's plan. And three years later, he says, who am I to judge? And he's wrestling in this horrendous thing in a very divided world. Because when you look at his flock and you ask him a question about gay marriage, it turns out that there is a very different sense of right and wrong across his flock. From 95% of Catholics in the Netherlands saying society should accept homosexuality to 91% saying absolutely not in Nigeria. So he's trying to manage a change in opinion, in global opinion, towards the right side, which is it's as stupid to discriminate against gays as it is to discriminate against somebody who's left-handed or other sexual orientations. I get that. But that's not the way that people were brought up. That's not the way people were educated. And so they think because their church, because their parents, because their grandparents, because their society, their teachers, their government taught them this, that this shift, which is driven by education, is driven by social media, is driven by radio, is driven by movies, is driven by exposure to one another. This is a huge shift that's occurring in a very fast period of time, that's completely discombobulating a lot of people. And and as you address these questions of right and wrong, you have to understand they shift over time. So even if you are on the right side of history today, you may not be tomorrow. In fact, what's okay today may be wrong tomorrow. And as you think about these things, take this 4th of July, a lot of us are going to come out of this thing and just have a bang up summer. And just, you can just taste that first hamburger, that first hot dog, that first outdoor, you know, cookout with your friends. And some of you will be vegan and you won't. But a lot of people on this call may have a hamburger. And that picture may look horrendous in 20 years. Because the price of synthetic meat per hamburger was 380,000 bucks in 2013, 30 bucks in 2015, nine bucks, 2020, seven bucks last week. And as this price drops, these pictures of walking into the fanciest steakhouse in town for a fancy post COVID dinner may look really horrendous. What the hell do you mean your parents would go and walk past rotting pieces of meat in a fancy restaurant to whet their hunger? How dare they have slaughtered 6 billion animals a year? But of course, that will come from a position of meat is available faster, better, cheaper in a different form. And your notion of, is it okay to cook what used to be a live animal on a grill? And what does that picture look like in 20 years? may look very different. How we treat prescription drugs, right? This is especially important these days because prescription drugs in the US are on average 2.5 times more than other countries. And so you end up with this figure of your money or your life, right? And and this is gonna be looked at not kindly by next generations. You had enough money and you let people die because insulin tripled in price, really? In what universe did you think that was okay? On the other hand, things that seem wrong to many of us, like editing babies, may seem 180 degrees tomorrow. Because you're at the stage where you're saying, there's a scandal because babies are being edited. 
yes, it was done wrong. It didn't have the peer review. It didn't have the controls. I get all that. But I also get that there could be a conversation in a few years where kids say to one another, do you know that my parents were so backward that they didn't edit out my KRAS genes? They didn't edit out my P53. They didn't edit out my BRAC. They were so primitive and savage that I have cancer now because they didn't edit me as a baby. And in fact, do you know that my mother actually carried me in her womb and exposed me when she went out to eat in exotic places or go mountain biking or travel instead of leaving me nice and safe inside a hospital? She, she actually carried me and gave birth to me. I mean, can you imagine how primitive that was. And again, the logic will flip 180 degrees. As we look at things like COVID, yes, we criticize the founding fathers. Yes, we criticize a whole bunch of awful things they did. But during a period where we're doing that, we've watched 560,000 people die in the United States. And the more who die, it seems the less we care. This is 1.6 times World War II, 5.6 times World War I. 9.6 times Vietnam and 23 times annual car deaths. And many of these deaths could have been prevented. And as we debate the past and argue with each other about the costumes we wear or the people we had dinner with or didn't have dinner, this stuff is going on. And they're caging children. And, you know, I'm sure that a lot of you were out in the streets outraged, socially distanced, protesting this. Maybe some of you weren't, and maybe some of you will be judged for that in the future, because maybe even you did something wrong. Things like this drive me absolutely bananas, right? So it's going to take the FDA 10 days as of today to go and review whether Johnson Johnson causes red clotting or not. Well, you know what? Let's review it, and let's just fast forward it 10 days, and let's say, yes, it does. Even in that case, what you're looking at is one death for 7 million, maybe two deaths for 7 million, because one of these people is in intensive care. What is the death from COVID? It's one in 590. So the cost of not acting, the cost of taking these vaccines off market for 10 days is going to be in the hundreds of lives. But somehow we think it's ethically justifiable to do that. And that's an incredibly important debate for all of you who are involved in technology, because when you look at self-driving cars, there's a lot of people, especially young people, who die of car accidents. What's the standard you want to set? A self-driving car should never kill anybody? Because they will. But should a self-driving car be approved only when it's twice as safe as the average driver? Five times as safe as the average driver? Ten times as safe? A hundred times as safe? Every time you raise the bar on that, you kill more people through inaction. Because those people are going to continue to die in car crashes. They're preventable car crashes. But not adopting this technology is absolutely wrong. Let me close by saying these are questions that are coming to you, and they're coming to you very quickly because life sciences is driving our ability to alter life forms, to alter organisms, to remake parts of our bodies to make synthetic life, which was a project that I was involved in, which was kind of a big deal. And we have now made printers, desktop printers, that allow us to print life forms. Insert one genome, create a different species. And yeah, that's gonna create one or two questions. Folks at the engineering School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard have been making biohybrid animals out of rat hearts cells, rubber and gold, Michael Levin from Tufts, published nanobots that may or may not be alive in the last week. Let me just remind you, technology is exponential. Technology changes ethics. Ethics may begin to change at exponential rates. And that's why we need to bring back two words that we very rarely hear in debates today, which are humility and forgiveness. Yes, what they did in the past was wrong. Yes, a lot of stuff that we did 10 years ago or said five years ago or five months ago or five minutes ago is wrong. 
but there's a lot of fury out there. There's a lot of righteousness. There's a lot, I'm right, you're wrong. I'm going to just destroy you because you're wrong. But inserting humility and forgiveness into a system like this becomes absolutely essential. Because when you use a word you can't use today a hundred times in Huckleberry Finn, or when you talk about Native Americans in the 1800s in a context which today we find insulting, you have to ask yourself, if I had been writing, if I had been educated, if I had read these books during that time, how would I have read it? Was, was this meant in hatred and anger? Or was this the way in which reasonable people who were trying to educate their kids and learn from their parents and be decent members of society thought it was okay? Is it okay? No, it's not okay. But judge people with a little bit more kindness and forgiving in the context of their times, in the context of people learn, and that's a good thing. Ethics is not an absolute. It changes over time. And applying today's standards to this stuff means that you begin to cancel people. It means you cannot have 40 names on public schools in San Francisco. It means that anybody can be taken or, you know, a statue, a name, a book, if it has any connection to slavery, oppression, racism, genocide, or anything similar. And that similar is really important because those rules change. And they change over time. And we're going to find a bunch of stuff in the next 50 years that are wrong. And we may have been wrong on a bunch of stuff. And we will have technologies that prove us wrong. Because technology does transform ethics. And technology is moving very quickly. So be a little kinder to one another. Be a little bit more understanding of one another. Be a little bit gentler with one another. And then do isolate the one or 2% that are truly evil people. But don't isolate the 50% that you disagree with or the 30% you disagree with. And let me stop there. Thank you, Juan, for this um, actually really brave, I would say thought provoking and, and very relevant and timely talk. In a moment, we'll go to questions from the audience, which people can submit by using the Slido link below the live stream window. But in the meantime, I have a couple of questions related uh, specifically to uh, the Media Lab and how your comments relate to uh, this whole community of innovators and researchers. Listening to your talk, we are reminded that we as uh, inventors of powerful new technologies like AI, social media, CRISPR, synthetic biology, have a lot of power and responsibility in shaping the future. Is it fair or is it right that we as inventors and engineers have more power to decide what the future looks like and what is right and wrong in the future? And how would you advise us uh, researchers and inventors on um, how to approach ethics in a thoughtful manner. Um, how can we be more inclusive and invite a larger community in discussions related to the technologies that we invent, uh, that we invent maybe even before we, we build them? <laughs> Um, and related to this as well, I have this question that comes up frequently in, uh, at the Media Lab um, uh, when somebody uh, proposes a really powerful new uh, technology. Uh, there's always every powerful new technology can be used for good and for bad. How should we think about that as inventors and researchers? Would you advise us not to work on developing some technology because it has particularly negative potential use cases? Or is it better as a researcher to be involved um, in the creation of a new technology that can be used for bad so we can help steer the use of these technologies towards or in a hopefully better direction? So let me start with things that we accept. We're, we're, we're debating the use of future technologies and what if something invented does X. And 
that's certainly a really important debate. It's also really important to understand that stuff that we sort of accept today is absolutely completely immoral. So for instance, you could easily see a scenario in 50 years where nuclear weapons have been eliminated and where people look back and they say, do you realize that there were literally six human beings on earth who had the power to push a button and destroy most of life on earth? And in what moral universe is that okay? Right? I mean, how, how, how are we thinking about the world in such a way that we think it's okay for the President of the United States, Russia, China, a couple of other countries to have the potential to really destroy a big chunk of life on Earth and, and you know, contaminate it for millions of years. And, and when you look at the debates over releasing the water that's slightly contaminated from Fukushima, that is child's play compared to the power that individuals have today. And somehow we think that's okay and acceptable. So I think it's really important to do a review of technologies that in retrospect, we're gonna say, why, why weren't people speaking out about that? Why weren't people you know, going nuts about that stuff? And there are those technologies. Mm-hmm. And then there's the hypothetical damage that a future technology can do and how afraid should you be? And my position on that is I tend to be an optimistic curmudgeon. I don't think history is linear. I don't think it always gets better. I don't think every year will be better. I don't think every technology will improve humanity. But on the whole, if you took John Rawls's dictum and you were born at random as X, Y, or Z, would you really rather be born into almost any society as a woman in the 1950s, in the 1900s, in the 1800s, in the 1700s, in the year 1000? if you were of a different ethnicity from the country that you're in or a different religion from the country, there's a whole lot that's wrong today. But would you rather have been born in the 1950s, 1900s, 1800s, 1850s? And and so I think people tend to look at technology in very dystopian views and they tend to look at the nasty effects of technology and certainly there are nasty technologies But on the whole, we're living a whole lot better today. And we're a whole lot more conscious of some of the evil going on in the world today. Among other things, because each of us has a broadcast studio inside our pockets. And so when something happens to George Floyd, it's not the first time there's been a George Floyd, but it's the first time that everybody in the United States, not just the city, reacts in a very short period of time. And in fact, throughout the world. Now, does that mean that in any way, shape, or form, what happened to George Floyd is justifiable? Absolutely not. But if we had these instruments, maybe we would have stopped lynchings earlier. If we had these instruments, maybe we wouldn't have treated each other in such a cruel way. So uh, I tend to be more optimistic about technology than many, understanding that, yeah, technology can be seriously misused. I think as uh, I mean that most of us at the Media Lab share your optimism about technology, but at the same time, I think we feel a little bit um, increasingly uncomfortable <laughs> with the fact that we have that special power and that um, we are defining the future um, uh, for others that have less to say about what technologies get in- invented. So I'm curious how you would. Uh, or whether you would also uh, encourage us to be more inclusive in the research itself and, in, and involve um, the, uh, the community more in discussions about what technologies should be created in the first place. Um, it seems unfair that we are the ones to, <laughs> to come up uh, or to decide this as opposed to involving everyone who will be uh, affected. No question. Mm-hmm. But I think you also have to look at what you've done. Mm -hmm. Because I think 
MIT was one of the first universities to put its courseware on the web open. Mm -hmm. And that is one way of bringing people in this debate and saying, look, this is what we're learning. We're going to be open about it. We're not going to hide it. And I think this, you know, one of the things that's going to come out of COVID that I think, you know, is going to be beneficial among all the loss of life and horrendous things that people have lived mm -hmm. is the ability to communicate and educate at a distance in a much more effective way. And the single most effective thing you can do to raise a society's standard of living is to educate women. I mean, disproportionate impact. As soon as women start getting educated, enormous impact on that society, on its children, on its wealth. And, and so I think bringing women and groups that have not had ed access to education into this equation is really important. There are other things, and, and it's interesting how simple these technologies can be. Having a washable floor makes an enormous difference in people's lifestyle. Because if you think about what it means to have a dirt floor that accumulates microbes for decades versus having a linoleum floor that you could just wash, or a kitchen countertop that's not wood, it's linoleum or something else. Having folic acid from others, two cents a day, enormous impact. Preventive medicine, very cheap, huge impact. So understanding the impact of cheap technologies. And, you know, one of the, one of the things that I think in retrospect is going to be seen as wrong and maybe even unethical, is how little we spend on vaccines and antibiotics. Because in terms of disability life years, an antibiotic that you give to somebody and they take it for 10 days and then they don't come back for decades has a disproportionate impact versus a third line end of life cancer treatment that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars that extends your life by a month or five months or six months. But the pricing model we have for pharmaceuticals means that a cheap medicine that cures you in 10 days and you don't see the patient again, doesn't do the same thing for your share price as an end of life, million dollars a year, last resort treatment that you have to have. And, and how we price these things, how we treat each other medically, how we debate universal basic income when we have enough. In what universe is it okay to walk over somebody on the streets of Boston who's freezing to death on a park bench? Mm -hmm. We have the money to address that. We have the money to address hunger. And, and you know, we are not doing that. We're, we're living, I think, in a very interesting stage of capitalism because for most of human history, the issue was there's not enough. So how do we distribute the little grain we have? How do we distribute the few medicines we have? How do we distribute the few houses we have? And, and today, we really are in a period of abundance. We can make more than enough bicycles. We can make more than enough antibiotics, more than enough calories for everybody on Earth. And it becomes more of an issue of distribution than it does availability. And that means scarcity is not the single and only driver of economic decision-making. And we're going to be judged pretty harshly because we did not understand that early enough. So you talk about how we should judge our ancestors possibly with more humility and forgiveness and, and, and also how maybe we should judge our contemporaries who disagree with us with more humility and forgiveness and, and maybe create more... Uh, spaces in the middle where there's a chance to uh, understand one another's points of view, learn from one another. How can we reoccupy the spaces between the trenches? And, and do you think that communications technologies can play a role in, in that, in uh, sort of coming out of our trenches to meet one another again? So Again, it it's really important not to depersonalize the debate. 
Because if you start from a viewpoint of everybody who votes in this way, or everybody who's ever said this, or anybody who's ever thought this is an evil person that I should never talk to or associate with, you, you could end up making some very stupid decisions. Let's assume for a second that you had a very good looking 15 year old daughter and you had an emergency and you had to leave her in the care of a babysitter for a week. Would you rather leave her with Barack Obama or Donald Trump? And once you've answered that, then tell me, would you rather leave her with Paul Ryan or Anthony Weiner? And the answer is, there are people who are not good people who have different points of view on various things. But 95, 96% of people are people who want their parents to respect them and love them. And they want their kids to respect them and love them. And they want their peers at work to feel like they're pulling their weight and that they're going doing a good job. And, and if you start with that viewpoint, as opposed to taking a wedge issue, which politics and media and social media are very good at driving and saying, we are different from this person because this person said this or this person did this. And I will never talk to this person. I will never associate with this person. I will always attack this person. Mm -hmm. Then you end up in a situation where you have to ask the question, how many stars will be in the US flag in 50 years? And that's actually a relevant question because in Europe, you're about to create Wales and maybe Scotland and the Walloons and the Southern Finns and the Corsicans and the Northern Italians. It is very easy to drive nations to pieces. You have tripled the number of nations in Europe during the 20th century. And when it comes to the United States, people say, well, that'll never happen here. Okay, fair enough. How many presidents of the United States have been buried under exactly the same number of stars they were born under? The answer to that question is exactly zero. There has never been a president of the United States buried under the same number of stars he was born under. So it's not as crazy a question as it seems. And if we want to divide ourselves, if we want to do away with e pluribus unum, then let's just convince ourselves that the other 49% is not worth associating with. That they are so fundamentally evil and wrong that we shouldn't even talk to them. So um, I'll move on to some of the questions from the audience. Uh, one is actually related to something I want to ask as well. Uh, we live in an era of globalization and communications uh, technologies. Um, and so we are more aware than ever of other people's lives and their contexts and so on. Um, would you say that there is more or less that there's an evolution towards more or less agreement than ever um, on what is right and wrong globally? Um, do you see uh, more sort of divergence of opinions or more convergence because of um, globalization and communications technologies? And I, I think on the whole, it, you know, it, it looks like one of these graphs of global wealth and global disease and global wars, where there's a whole series of ups and downs, some of which are just brutal. But on the whole, the trend is up and right. So the amount of time a person lives on average, way up the average income of a person. We've taken a quarter of the population of Earth out of poverty in about 25 or 30 years. The amount of people who are hungry in the world today, and I understand, especially during COVID, it has grown astronomically. But when compared to the 1970s, when you had the concert for Bangladesh, it's a different system of having systemic global famines almost every five years. So there's a lot that's going wrong. But again, would you rather be born on average in the 1950s or 1900s or 1800s? No. I, I think technology is enabling us to be more generous to one another. I don't think we've learned that lesson yet. And I don't think we've learned 
how to forgive people who didn't have as many options as we did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this relates to another question um, from Anonymous. Is your argument that because future societies will make different judgments, we should not make them today? And uh, another related question, is ethics determined by popularity or are there better, more long-lived or social basis uh, than what most of us currently believe to decide on ethics? So I think ethics almost looks like one of these product adoption curves that looks like these S curves except that the speed of change in what's right and wrong has been accelerated massively by our ability to do things differently. So for a long period of time, when you didn't have the ability to do things differently, there was a standard evolution and it was very slow. But even there, it's really important to understand how ethics and evolution have been related. So you start out, you know, in a big chunk of the world's religions with a common core driven by Abraham. And then Abraham sprouts out Judaism and Judaism eventually becomes Orthodox and becomes, you know, Ashkenazi and becomes a whole series of other options. And out of Judaism also comes Christianity. And then Christianity starts to subspeciate and it becomes Dominicans and Franciscans and Jesuits and everything else. And then it branches again into this massive Lutheran Protestant branch. And then the Protestant reformist branch begins to, you know, break out into Methodists and breaks out into this, that, and the other. And last I looked, there were about 42 subspecies of Baptists that range from the most liberal to the most conservative. And out of that same core of Abraham, you also get Islam. And then you get Sunni and you get Shia and you get Sufi, but it hasn't had the same kind of breakdown and speciation to occupy different niches. It's become, in many places, much more fundamentalist. Not every place, but certainly not the same variety of groups and subgroups and subgroups. And, and that leads to some really interesting questions as to what the future of some of these things is. And by the way, when you look at religions, which were the main driver of ethics, many of them did not evolve. Many of them did not adapt and adopt. And so what people forget is 99% of the world's religions are extinct. And that's why when you go to a art museum or you go to an archeology span museum or you go to a history museum, a lot of what you're looking at is dead gods. You're walking past the god of rain. You're walking past the god of the sun. You're walking past Zeus. You're walking past, you know, this, that, or the other. And so ethical systems that don't learn, don't adapt, don't transform themselves across time. They become extinct, even if they were dominant once upon a time. Another question from Anonymous, your talk seems to suggest that you believe that progress in ethics is a result of progress in technology. Is that a misrepresentation question? And what do you think the role of people who don't work in science, technology, design, and engineering is in ethics? I think there have been many drivers across time of changes in ethics and religion. Um, there was a period of time when one of the biggest drivers was the amount of corruption. When you had popes who were, you know, sleeping with their sisters and paying for indulgences and stuff, there was a, such a huge disconnect between what you were preaching and what was happening that there was a breakdown of the system because of the dissonance in the teachings. I think we've had technology for very short periods of time. And I think we are incredibly privileged to live in a period where technology has given us choices that no other civilization or person has had. So 
I think what I'm saying is technology is not the only driver of right and wrong. It is becoming increasingly a driver that gives us options to act in different ways. And in the measure that we act in different ways, we are tending to act, not always, not in a linear fashion, in more ethical ways. So there has been huge harm caused by technology in some aspects, but on the whole, technology has driven more ethical behaviors and it is becoming an ever larger driver of ethics. Mm -hmm. Now, related to that, while technology generally results in more equality, more opportunities and uh, resulting positive changes in ethics, it seems that sometimes when technology and society changes too quickly, um, that can actually have a negative effect on ethics in that some groups uh, become more conservative when change happens too quickly. Um, so would you agree with that? And um, should we be careful maybe that technology doesn't evolve too quickly because that may actually result in um, uh, sort of a backlash really, even though technology may have many positive uses uh, towards technology because people just don't always appreciate that their world changes uh, too quickly. That assumes that we could control the pace of technology <laughs> and discovery, which is a great a big bit. assumption, <laughs> right? Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I think we have to ask questions in parallel, which is as technology is deployed, what does it change? And how do we help people? So, you know, this issue of the future of work is an absolutely essential question because I think the hours that we worked on average in the 1900s are inconceivable to people, to most people today. The notion that you would start working at age six and that you probably wouldn't go to school and that you'd work in a coal mine or that you'd work in a uh, factory or that you'd work in the fields from age six on and work for 12 hours a day from age six on is, is something which we consider child slavery. And, and again, technology has given us a series of options to not have to do that. But I could easily see a situation where half of the jobs go away and we generate more than enough income to take care of those folks and allow those folks to have a decent lifestyle. So I think when we address changes in technology and labor, we have to do two things. We have to look at how do we create a minimum basis of if you are a human being, you are going to have enough to eat. You are going to have a place to sleep. You are going to have the basic medicines and you're going to have some income. Now, beyond that, you know, you can earn more. By virtue of being a human being, we have enough today with what we have. And it becomes a distribution question as opposed to an availability issue. That's really important. But then there's a second aspect, which is really important, which is I, I think the relationship to work is very different in Europe and the United States. And again, this depends on the individual. But if you play the stereotype, you're, a lot of Europeans would say they work to live. And in the U.S., you have a very different relationship in your identity to your work, right? So one of the first questions an American asks that you don't get asked in Europe is, what do you do? Because your identity is focused on that job. And if you're going to do away with half the jobs, then it's not enough to provide a universal basic income and a basic standard. It becomes a question of what's that transitional identity? And, and those are questions that technology, rather than asking the question, how do we slow technology, it's what does technology enable us to do that we couldn't do before and what does that change? And how do we adopt and adapt to this new world? There's a second aspect of technology which is incredibly important, which is because we have ever more powerful technologies, the cost of leaving people behind and the cost of having a lot of angry people increases astronomically. Because the damage that one angry hacker can do in some godforsaken place, or that one person using biowarfare can do in some godforsaken place, it gets really expensive 
to play this us versus them game. It becomes really expensive to say, I got mine, tough luck for you. It, it, we really have to treat each other better mm -hmm. across the world because we have ever more power to help each other and to hurt each other. Yeah. I have so many more questions, but I'm afraid that we already are out of time. Um, thank you so much, Juan, for being here and for the fascinating talk. I would recommend uh, to people that they read your book um, if they want to see a longer or read a longer thread on uh, the same topic. Uh, so thank you. You'll only hear my claps, <laughs> but I'm sure many others are clapping as well. Um, to uh, the rest of you, I hope that you will join us in two weeks uh, when Todd Macover will host an equally exciting guest, uh, composer, artist, and performer, George Lewis. And thank you, and see you next time. Thank you very much.